going to be talking about two topics today. They're both very important and actually pretty closely related. Whenever one of our officers has to use their weapon, it makes news. But when officers are able to manage a situation without force, the community rarely knows about it. That's why we want to share a story of de-escalation. This occurred this past Monday. Captain Luke Sell from the University City Division and Major Steve Brochu from our Special Operations Bureau are going to tell you about a dangerous situation that occurred earlier this week. It involved a five-month-old child who is alive and her father who's in jail, both completely unharmed and thanks to the excellent work of our officers, they handled this situation strategically and used every tool available to them in order to avoid a situation that could have easily turned deadly. After that, Chief Putney is going to talk about the department's body-worn camera program, the role of the footage in officer-involved shootings, and the process of releasing it to the community. First up is Captain Luke Sell, S-E-L-L, -L, and Major Steve Brochu, B-R-O-C-H-U. Captain and Major, turn it over to you. Good morning. Uh, today we're here to talk about some outstanding, fantastic work done by officers, uh, our techs, our detectives, and our operators. Um, so we'll take you back to Monday, about 12:15. We received a call through 911, frantic female who stated that her son, adult son, uh, had threatened to kill himself and his five-month-old daughter. Uh, of course, very serious situation. She also said that as he left the home, uh, he fired a gun into the air, and it didn't hit anybody, fortunately. University City officers quickly responded, and upon their arrival, we recognized very quickly the gravity of the situation. Uh, officers quickly asked for a citywide bolo to be put out, and, and the, the bolo was simply to make sure that any officer around the city, whether it be in South Division or in Freedom Division, realizes what's going on with the, with the situation and how severe it is. Uh, they also contacted the Real-Time Crime Center. Our Real-Time Crime Center began monitoring cameras in the area to see if we could pick up that car, uh, find that, those occupants. Uh, we also contacted our missing persons unit to begin the process of the Amber Alert. Officers also took the mother, the female, down to the magistrate's office to obtain some warrants for communicating threats and the child endangerment. We also notified our SWAT team, uh, as well as our violent criminal apprehension team, of the, the update and the, the warrants of, on this subject uh, in order to get them plugged in and get their operators ready to go. So uh, after, and the last thing I will say is a short time later, uh, after we, we had done all of that, we received a call from the infant's biological mother, uh, who also lives in the University City Division, and she stated that he had come, the subject had come to her house, threatened her, and uh, threatened again to kill himself as well as the five-month-old. So we're talking about very serious circumstances. Uh, at this point, VCAT was uh, operational uh, as well as SWAT, and I'll let Major Brochu talk about some of those. So good morning, everybody. My name is Steve Brochu with the Special Operations Bureau, and I'm going to talk to you about the apprehensions efforts which were involving the SWAT team, uh, VCAT, as well as SBI. Um, so when we activated the units, uh, they immediately began an operation to locate the vehicle and conduct a surveillance operation. Uh, we did locate the vehicle uh, with the man inside. Uh, we did not know at the time when the vehicle was located whether or not the child was inside. Of course, we can't see inside at that point um, whether, whether the vehicle was, uh, uh, had child seat or anything else. So we knew we had the person that we were looking for in the vehicle. <clears throat> uh, we knew that stopping the car would put the child in harm's way. Uh, we mentioned before, and, and I'll say it a little bit further, but he had made threats to the child's life, uh, which is extremely serious and dangerous to everybody, including the child and the suspect and the officers. Um, so we conducted this surveillance operation for several hours. At one point, the suspect calls his mother and says he is going to return to his house uh, or his apartment, and he's going to retrieve some items for the baby. If he sees the police, he's going to kill his daughter, and he's going to shoot it out with the police. Um, so knowing that information, uh, we conducted and continued our surveillance op 
with some very competent detectives and did a fantastic work providing intelligence to our tactical units. Um, I, I do want to make one note. In addition to this, throughout the event, he was getting on social media. He was also making contact with associates, threatening to harm himself, threatening to harm his daughter again, as well as to shoot it out with police. So that was apparent to us, and again, very serious. The family reiterated to us that they felt he would follow through on these threats and uh, continue that. So that was kind of our mindset in proceeding through this operation. As, uh, as the suspect had returned to his house, he takes the child out of the car. That information is relayed from surveillance officers to tactical officers and goes inside his apartment. Once inside the apartment, um, we started to, to uh, surround and contain, and at that point, the suspect, which is what we had hoped for the whole time, came out of his apartment alone and was going to go retrieve something to his, at, or in his car. The hope for us and the whole plan was to take the suspect into custody, absent the child without it being nearby or anybody else for that matter, and do it in a way that we train with SWAT operators, which is called a takeoff. Um, SWAT deployed immediately on the suspect. Long before he ever knew he was being taken into custody, uh, he was safely in handcuffs, unharmed, uh, and without any injury to officers or himself. Uh, in addition to that, the second element moves into the uh, apartment, secures that, and immediately retrieves the child. Um, so the child was taken. She was unharmed. Uh, we turned her over to our tactical medics just as a precaution, uh, which is standard for us and a uh, medic took uh, charge of the baby. <clears throat> the uh, uh, element that went inside the apartment also retrieved a firearm inside. Uh, it was a handgun uh, in, inside the apartment. The important thing about this is we want to talk about this arrest for a variety of reasons, but the absolute training, the dedication of the men and women that do these jobs, um, along with the assistance of the community and the family, uh, who are providing us updates and information and partnering with us is the whole reason this came to fruition the way it did. This is probably one of the more serious events that law enforcement will be involved in because it's obviously involving a child and a known existing threat. Um, and the person themselves was telling this they were going to shoot, shoot it out with us. Um, so I, we want to share this with you. We want to reiterate this with you. That cooperative effort uh, saved someone's life and saved many lives, I believe. So I want to thank you for all that, for, for listening to us. Um, and again, everyone drove home that night very, very relieved. Uh, with that being, I'll take some questions. Major, is that why there were officers in the parking lot here on Monday with long rifles? So there's a, uh, a heightened threat or heightened awareness when someone threatens law enforcement, and part of that posture is to secure our facility. Any other questions? When we're in university area, did you... Um, eventually catch him at the apartment complex. Where was that? Uh, we'll give you that address in the case report. All right. Thank you, Major. Captain. Yeah, as Major alluded, we'll send out, uh, after this, we'll send out the two incident reports uh, that the Major spoke about there. So, second topic today, equally as important, Chief Putney is going to discuss the department's body-worn camera a policy and how we move forward with releasing body-worn camera footage uh, to the community. Chief Putney. Good morning. Good morning. I do want to talk to you about a couple of things, one of which is, as Brad said, the uh, process for release of body-worn camera uh, video footage, also the officer-involved shooting process overall. Uh, just keep in mind there are two things that uh, we must maintain the integrity of. First is the investigation, and second is when the release of the body-worn camera footage uh, is released. It is no longer up to the chief of police. As of October 2016, the law changed so that now it rests in the hands in the decision of a superior court judge. Only a superior court judge can release that body-worn footage. Within the uh, Austin Vaughn shooting, our Austin Vaughn shooting team, uh, our senior and expert uh, detectives, of our homicide and ADW unit respond to do the investigation. Very senior, um, senior pro professionals. Also, as you know, uh, they're going to do the criminal investigation. A parallel tract is the internal investigation, which is conducted by our Internal Affairs Bureau. Uh, that's, that's how the investigation begins. Um, it takes us 
uh, a month, a month and a half or so to do the investigation, depending on the complexity of the case. At that point, it's presented to the district attorney. The district attorney will then determine whether or not uh, laws have been violated. That takes a couple of months, uh, six to eight weeks or so, roughly. And again, depending on the complexity of the investigation. Um, once he makes his determination, uh, our internal affairs investigation continues. We'll set an internal board hearing, a chain of command board hearing, to determine whether or not any of our policies have been violated, departmental policies. So you have the district attorney determining whether or not the um, officer involved shooting was legal, and then you have the internal, which determines whether or not policies were followed and any tactical errors need to be addressed. So as far as the body-worn camera release, I talked about who releases it, a Superior Court judge, but also um, I want to make sure everybody understands that is but one piece of the puzzle in the complex investigation. You have witness statements. You have uh, statements of, um, uh, you also have physical evidence. Sometimes we have body-worn camera footage and either other camera footage that is uh, in the area of the incident. So all of those pieces of the puzzle, when there's a fatality, when the subject dies, the medical examiner has a role to play to determine exactly what happened. Uh, that was the proximate cause of death. So all of those pieces of the puzzle come together. It's easy, and on the, and, you know, on, the, on the television shows, it looks like body-worn camera gives you everything. I want to make sure everybody understands it doesn't. It is very serious and a very important part of the investigation. But no, too, uh, it's never easy to look at. I've looked at way too many. Um, and I can tell you this, even if lawful, body-worn camera footage of an officer-involved shooting that results in a fatality is awful to see. It's horrible. It's a loss of life. We've had a life that's been taken from this community. The family of the deceased is always devastated. Also, the officers involved have their lives turned upside down. They're devastated as well. It's impacting their families as well. So what I tell people is um, we like to rush to judgment and determine on our own whether or not it's justified even before it goes to the district attorney. Uh, that's not advisable. The other thing is looking at one piece of the puzzle, the video in and of itself, is not going to give you a complete picture that the district attorney must assess in making his decision. Uh, that is the process. I know there have been a lot of questions about it. I wanted to also give you a timeline. So in a couple of weeks, uh, the district attorney should have the full investigation from our detectives and, and the officer involved shooting team. And then within a couple of months or so, he should be able to make a definitive decision about whether or not laws have been violated. Soon thereafter, we will convene a board to see if our policies have been violated internally and uh, determine whether or not the officer acted appropriately within the guidelines of policy. And if, and if they have been violated, we hold the officer accountable at that point. What are your questions about anything I've covered? Chief Putnam, I'm shocked, ma'am. I'm sorry. Let's start there, and then I'll come to you. She's going to have three or four, so I'll go there, then I'll come to you, then I'll go back. We know how this works. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I can go. Oh, I think you said something else about I said you got one, and then we'll come back to you for the rest okay. of it. Okay. Um, yes, can the video on a body-worn camera look not look good? But still be okay. justified to Very good question. Can it not look? It look it, I've, I've seen a lot of them, too many. They all look awful. It's horrible. Um, it's a loss of life. There's nothing you want to see um, that compares to it. Um, and even given that, sometimes the shooting can still be legal. And it's, um, I, I tell everybody, what you bring to the viewing of a video like this is not going to be... Um, most people will get whether or not it's legal based on what they see, but there are some who support officers regardless, and they're going to think regardless um, it's a justified shooting. There's a minority who think that way. There's also a minority, minority who think um, regardless of what I see, it's still um, inappropriate and not the right thing to do. I get both extremes, but truthfully, the people in the middle get it. It's about the law, and then it's about accountability regarding policy. So there's no video that you're going to see and an officer involved shooting that results in a fatality that's going to be pleasant to see. None. Yes, sir. So, Chief, I think we understand that the law has a place here. We've got to follow it. But even when following the law, sometimes a lot of damage can be done. Absolutely. So when you look at what happened with Keith Scott, where the family is saying he was holding a book, video later shows there was a gun, or when you're talking about this recent shooting on Beatty's Ford where you know, other folks are saying he was not armed, yet police are saying he was armed, he was threatening people. 
Is there anything you can do, even while the, the course of the law is playing out over a long period of time, to try to de-escalate tensions, sure. to, to work with the judge? How can you try to get out a little piece of this a little sooner? Very good question. Work with the judge? No. That is not possible. But um, having the conversation is, which is what we started uh, Thursday a week ago. Um, having the community come out, ask questions specific to the process, and we're going to continue that conversation um, around the city, um, is something that we can do. And also let people be heard. Um, what we're trying to do differently and more intensely is allowing for the release of that emotion. We have to allow for that. In the course of that, if we can explain the process and people get a better understanding of the process and, and gain a bit of respect for the process, that's great too. But ultimately, I can't try that case. I'm done talking about a specific case. Um, and the beauty of physical evidence and video footage is sometimes it dispels the rumors that swirl around any shooting. I wish I could control them. I can't. All I can do is continue to put out specific facts, and I've done that since the, this shooting happened, this particular officer and bar shooting happened. I do it with every one of them. But what I cannot do and I will not do is try that case uh, to public opinion. That is not justice and we seek justice. Justice has to go through the process. As time consuming as that can be, we have to allow for that. Very good question, I appreciate it. Uh, Shaw. Yes, ma'am. How do you, well, I guess, attempt to convince the public? They're looking at this body-worn camera, right? And let's say they don't see, I guess what people would consider that lethal threat. Most people would say a lethal threat is, you know, to They don't see an imminent lethal threat. Yes. Right. And yes. so they, they don't see a gun in the person's yes. hand, or sure. they don't see that, like you said, an imminent lethal threat. How do you convince people, as you were talking about, but the, the totality yes, of everything, yes, and to put themselves in an officer's shoes? You know, when an officer gets there and they're thinking of everything, but then they're looking and they're not seeing. How do you get people to... Wrap their heads around it. Yeah. That's, that's the challenge. It really is. Um, the reason we do the workshops and, and seminars and we put people in the position of um, uh, encountering uh, what we consider an imminent lethal threat is the only way to really get it is to go through it. And we do that everywhere across the jurisdiction. All you have to do is have a group of people who want to see it. We'll bring it up to you. Um, we also invite you to come to our place and see it as well. The only way to do it is to experience it, truthfully. And the other piece of it is... Um, the Supreme Court's been pretty clear. An imminent lethal threat is, in the, um, is an objective standard, an objective reasonable standard in the eyes of a reasonable officer. So you have to see what is reasonable. You have to see what is that threat that can kill me or do serious bodily injury. And you have to think it's about to happen right now. That's the legal standard. And again, people expect you to have the gun pointed directly at you and seeing the finger squeeze the trigger, yeah, that's not imminence. It's basically too late at that point. So the only way to really get people to fully understand it and grasp it is to have them experience what that looks like. I can tell you all day, but words aren't as impactful as actually going through it, having your heart rate get up a, a little bit, even though you're just looking at a screen that can't hurt you, and you see for yourself what imminence uh, looks and feels like. That's about the only way um, we can get people to truly understand it. So you, mentioned, come to you, uh, you, you have released some facts. Are there any additional facts you can give us kind of ahead of a potential release of this video of what we might see or what you've since found out in this specific shooting? Uh, actually, I can't. Uh, to be respectful of um, uh, all people involved and the integrity investigation, I'm done talking about the particular case. Uh, what I can tell you is in a number of weeks, in a couple of weeks, it'll be going over to the district attorney, and hopefully within a couple of months or so, you get the full uh, understanding of this case in particular and his decision thereabout. Yes, sir. Uh, well, I'm kind of snow my thunder. Good. I will ask you. Uh, how would yeah, you get another one. Then. That's right. That's right. <laughs> how, would, how would you respond to activists and others who have have made complaints about CMPD's level of transparency regarding this particular shooter? Um, how would I respond to that? Well, they said you haven't been transparent enough. Sure. Um, I'll tell you this. I've been responsibly transparent, and that's the standard. I've given everything I could without jeopardizing the process that leads to justice. And I'll never do that. Um, I'm not going to satisfy everybody. And listen, I'm not in the happiness business. I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to give people um, what they deserve, and that is an objective, reasonable, logical seeking of facts, truth, and justice. The only way to do that is for me as a chief to shut up, let the process run its course, and uh, to continue to let people talk and have this conversation. 
I love that point because I encourage people to have that conversation, that dialogue. It makes us better. We're in the process right now of revamping our whole policy around use of force because of conversations like that. And I'll tell you, I don't have to do, agree with you to learn from you. So that's the whole point of the conversations we're going to have around the city continuing. We had one at Friendship Missionary Baptist Church to start it. Uh, had 316 people show up. Um, vast majority of those people, I think, had a very good, even though emotional conversation. I think some people stepped away learning more about the process. And, and we're going to continue those. But what I'm not going to do is try this case out in public opinion. That wouldn't be fair to any of the families involved. And that would be an affront to justice. You did two things in his last shooting that, we'll come back, sir. that, that I thought was a change. One, very quickly, you were countering on social media. Yes, sir. Because you can say what you want about months before the end of this story. The story is right now and upset people and things that can happen in ugliness to try to at least get some kind of a dialogue going. So I thought that yes, social sir. media thing That's number one. Yes, strong. Sir. It was also strong to look up and see Major Mike out there talking to people. Mm -hmm. We lined up the cars to protect the scene and everybody bunkered in, but then there was a point when police tried to actually engage people yes. and have a conversation. Yes, sir. So I would expect, would we see more of that in situations yes, like sir. this? Yes, sir. That's what we did that following Thursday as well, where we had people come in and hosted that co similar conversation. We're going to continue that. We know people are hurting. Um, I know at least two families are eternally so. Uh, they, they have, um, you know, um, loss and they have experienced things that I wish no family had to, um, from the family of Mr. Franklin to um, the officers involved. Um, it is unfortunately um, a sequence of events that happens too often, not just here, but across the country. Um, so yes, we're going to continue the conversation. I think um, that is essential to making sure people have a better understanding, can release that emotion and I uh, can better understand the process. Yes, sir. I just want you quickly, you mentioned you were revamping the process for evaluating officer-involved shootings. Can no, I didn't. I said I'm revamping our use of force policy. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be a... Can expand upon that? Sure, I will, about? but I'm not going to get ahead of myself. I'm going to give you a full understanding of that, and thanks for volunteering. I hope you'd want to be a part of it. But what we want to do is show you um, what we didn't touch on with the um, SWAT negotiation uh, response is there are expert de-escalators. They've mastered it. They're great at it. Um, if you look at what happens when we have the time to gain cooperation and, and establish communication, we can virtually always de-escalate. When we go into a complex and a, and a controversial and a, um, uh, a quickly evolving situation and there's no time, there's no benefit, we can't slow things down, uh, we sometimes have consequences that we prefer not to have. What I can tell you is um, I take pride in the fact that our people, all of our people, have really embraced this idea of de-escalation even more so. Um, and if you look at our deployments with SWAT, we haven't had a fatal shooting in SWAT since 2016. They get 80 to 100 calls a year. They have full deployments 20 to 25 times a year. And just like in this case, um, when we can get people to cooperate, when you disarm yourself and we can establish communication, we can make it in, uh, we can bring it out safely, and everybody survives, which is our preference. But what we're doing there is we're making sure, just like the mission of SWAT, we continue to emphasize the goal of protection of life. Uh, preservation of life is, is, is at our core, and that's the emphasis around what we're doing when we come to with the, um, the uh, new policy for response to resistance. It's not just a philosophical change. It's more about emphasizing that de-escalation component and getting better at it. All right, we've got a couple more. Yes, ma'am. Um, are, you, are you in part of, part of the reason why you're addressing this today? Is it because of the hearing tomorrow, the potential of the video being released tomorrow? And the second part to that is, are you concerned that uh, from the so last... So the first answer is no, but I'm aware that that's happening. Go ahead. Okay. And are you concerned that the body-worn um, video, the camera video from the pre this previous shooting at Burger King, okay. um, are you concerned that people will see something and not think it through? Um, are you right, concerned so with the video shows? Am I concerned? Well, the video shows a loss of life, right. which is always concerning and tragic. Um, what, what I would like to do 
and the whole point of the conversation is have people better understand the process right get some assurances that we're following the process as best we can the best process that in the best practice of the process uh, based on what we see across the country and what we've experienced here and hopefully people will be a bit more reasonable reasonable and logical I get the emotion that's why we're having a conversation because no one piece of evidence including body-worn camera footage can tell the whole story it can give you some specifics that support the facts that have been put out but it can't tell you everything I wish I could tell intent by looking at a flat screen and seeing something transpire in front of me I can't so there are always pieces that have to be pieced together by uh, senior uh, professional expert investigators and that's what we have in our also involved shoot team of detectives yes sir Chief, are you okay with the law that allows the preemptive release of video? I mean, it sounds to me like you, you would prefer everything come out at the end. Uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I mean... Please don't. Yes, I'll tell you this. Um, the truth of the matter is, um, I've said before, it's, it's bigger than me. Um, I'm not... I, I couldn't care less. I really couldn't. As long as we have an opportunity to finish our investigation, the criminal investigation, when the body-worn camera footage goes out, it's, it's not important to me. Uh, what is important to me is that people who want to see everything right now slow down a bit. It takes weeks for us to get statements locked in. We have people who say they saw things, and then when we talk to them, um, that turns out not quite to be the case. It takes a while to get to that. Everybody doesn't show up, stay put, and give us the information we need right on the scene, so it takes a while. Uh, the other piece of that, though, is um, um, the judge, Superior Court judge, will decide whether or not the release is going to impact the pursuit of justice, and only the Superior Court judge should have that that uh, opportunity to um, make that decision. So I th I'm okay with the law. I think it's more appropriate. Um, it it takes a bit of objectivity and places it at the hands of the right person, I believe. So when it's released, it's going to depend on the Superior Court judge. My only reservation would be: should we release it immediately within a day or two? There's no way to do an investigation this complex in two days. So that's when I would say, let's slow down a bit. All right. I know you have more. There'll be ample opportunity for more. Yes, ma'am. Do you? One, one more? So yes. So they shouldn't be legally justified but still um, come close to or violate the department policies? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It can be legally justified. And again, I tell everybody, the legal standard is the lowest standard, in my opinion. It is the specific standard that gives guidance across the country. And it's good that we have a legal standard. I would not do this job if we didn't have a legal standard. If the legal standard was I have to be shot at before I can defend myself, this is not a job I would ever, ever choose. Um, however, our goal is, as I said before, always the preservation of life. And within that, our policy dictates how we respond, what type of things we do tactically, um, communication-wise, and everything else that we see as being even higher to achieve a higher level to achieve than just whether or not there was an imminent lethal threat, which is a legal standard. Make sense? All right. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Good to see you. I know we'll talk more. Okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Ask, yes, sir. Are you guys going to object to the release of the video at the hearing? Or are we going to object as a police department? Right. Or support the release of it? No, sir. We're not going to object. Um, I can't say what the uh, prosecutor will do, but at, at this point, we're in a better position investigation-wise to um, have all we need to finish our investigation within the next couple of weeks. So we're not going to be opposed to it at this point. All right. Thank you all. All right. Thank you, Chief. Major Brochu and Captain Sell. Major Brochu and Captain Sell are still here. They're available if you guys would like to talk offline with them. We will be sending out additional information uh, specifically about our officer-involved shooting process as well as the case reports from the incident on Monday. So thank you all for coming today. Appreciate it. Have a great day.